It seems like every year, guys, we get a game that everybody has to play. And it seems like this year, it might be Dragon Dogma 2. Whether you played Dragon Dogma 1, or this is the first time you play Dragon Dogma 2, there is a lot of things to learn about this game. Today, we're gonna dive in, talk about all the little things that I feel like are extremely important. So let's go ahead, take a preview of Dragon Dogma 2. So let's get the well-known stuff out of the way. It's made by Capcom. It's made by people who have worked in Devil May Cry. It has a very, really similar story to Dragon Dogma 1. And this gives us a really good premise that the game is made by people who know how to make RPG and know how to make combat. Now, one of the most integral parts about this game is that it's a multiplayer game, but theoretically it's not. What I mean by this is that this particular game, it's only meant to be a single player game, but there are integral elements within the game that kind of make it seem like a multiplayer game. The way this works is that you have a main character, the character you control, the character you move around with, and the one that it's gonna determine the way you play the game, and you're gonna have different vocations. Now, at the start of the game, you're gonna be given an option to pick what type of vacation you want. So the vacations are divided into three different categories. You have your starting vocations, you have your advanced vocations, and you have your hybrid vocations. There's a total of 10 of them, so it's gonna be really important that you pick them accordingly. I will have a separate video going over the vocations and which ones I recommend you guys should pick, but I just wanna give you guys a quick overview since this might be the first time you ever hear about this game or might be the deciding factor if you pick one. So there is a fighter vocation. This is gonna be your standard RPG class, which is gonna be wielding a one-handed sword and a shield. You have your mage, of course, your caster, who is really good for casting out magic, being an offensive and defensive uh, class for support and offense. You have your thief, which is gonna be a prim primarily a vocation that focuses on delivering quick burst melee damage to enemies. You have your archer, which is gonna be the character that's gonna allow you to deal damage to enemies from a distance. And then those are going to be your starting vocations. Now, on part of the starting vocations, we also have the other category, which is going to be your advanced vocations. Now, these advanced vocations are going to be extremely important when we get into the second topic of this video, which are going to be the pawns. But let me just go ahead and break them down. So we have the warrior. This is a vocation that, once again, very similar to the other one, relies heavily on his shields and on heavy armor. We have the Sorcerer, which is going to be able to choose a vocation that will take magic wielding abilities to the next level. So just like an upgraded version of the Mage. Now, those are the only two subcategories that we currently know that are part of the advanced vocations. In addition to that, we have your hybrid vocation. So this is a combination between these particular characters intertwined together. We have the Mystical Spear Hand, which is pretty much a brand new vocation that's coming into Dragon Dama 2 which is gonna be a mix of a knight and a magic casting character. We have the magic archer, which is once again a mix of an archer mixed with magic. We have the trickster vocation, which is another hybrid vocation that specializes in conjuring and also creating a lot of smoke to just you know disappear and vanish. We have the warfarer, which is gonna be a class that's gonna be really crazy because it's gonna allow you to carry three different weapons within that vocation. So these are gonna be your hybrid vocations and you're gonna be given a chance to pick any of these. Now, the great thing about this game is the fact of what I mentioned earlier, which is that it's a single player game with multiplayer elements and this is where the pawn system comes into play. Because even though you're playing as a single single player, you're going to be given a chance to pick up a pawn. A pawn is an additional character that you could bring into your group and assign one of these vocations from the advanced vocations for your pawn. So for example, let's say you want to play as a fighter, but you want a mage to come along with you or an archer, you're able to pick that vocation for a pawn and that pawn will be learning that vocation as he's progressing and as you're progressing and leveling up in the game. But wait, it doesn't stop there. Because in addition to this particular pawn that you're able to pick, you'll be able to recruit two more additional pawns. And this is where the multiplayer aspect of the game comes involved. Because these additional pawns, you will be able to meet them as you're moving along the map. Now, the great thing about these pawns is that these pawns are pawns from other players within the world. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how a pawn that someone creates and gives them the stats, gives them the abilities, is gonna be able to fare very well within your crew. So think of it this way, think of it like you train your perfect warrior and someone else will be able to get your warrior 
to be able to assist them in a fight. Now, the great thing about these pawns is that some of them are going to be able to give you hints and clues on how to defeat certain enemies because that player's pawn that you're recruiting might be more advanced in the storyline and might have already fought a character along the line that you haven't fought already, but he's there to assist you and give you tips on your gear, give you tips on what type of magic might work well depending on what pawn you recruit. Now remember, you have one personal pawn and then you have two more additional pawns that you're able to recruit from other people who are also playing the game. This offers a very interesting mechanic and something we haven't really seen in that many games. Now that we know the characters, now that we know the pawns, let's talk about what you're going to be doing in the game. So currently the game has three main objectives. Number one is this main storyline. And the great thing about the game is, is that it's an open world. You're able to go wherever you want, but there is a main storyline to play. Now, in addition to that, as you're progressing and moving around the world, there are going to be quests that you're able to partake. Now, it's going to be extremely important that you pay attention to this because this is where things get really crazy in this game. So when you decide to do a quest, if you don't complete that quest, you cannot replay that quest. So that is one thing. Number two is the quests are actually given to you by folks who are running around in the location. Now, the way that you're able to decipher these quests, depending, like, let's say they tell you you got to find someone that, you know, lost a kid and you have to go look for this kid. They might tell you, you know, you can only find this kid if you find the glowing flowers. Now, if that is the case, then you're going to have to wait till it becomes nighttime because there is a day to night cycle to find these particular, you know, flowers. In addition to that, when it becomes dark, other crazy monsters come out that do not come out during the day. So there's a big kind of change of challenge when it comes to fighting at night and fighting during the day. But the crazy thing is you still got to remember you got to complete the quest. Even though as long as you're moving throughout the world, you're going to find caves, you're going to find different areas that have different fights going on, and you might veer off from your main quest. If you don't remember you got to complete it, then you're just going to have to be like, man, I couldn't find the kid. So it's very interesting the way the quests work. Now, in addition to that, I did want to highlight one thing that you might need to know about the game that's going to be a very focal point about the game. And that is the way you actually travel in the game. Because currently right now, if you guys have played any other games, you guys know that we there are vehicles you could use to travel. Uh, you know, we have fast travel points that you're able to do. In this particular game, there is going to be a fast traveling option, but it's going to be very limited. Think of it kind of like Elden Ring, but not as intensive where you have multiple areas to fast travel to. This game, you have to carry a particular item within your inventory to fast travel to that specific location. And there is not that many places to fast travel to. And the only way to fast travel in is not by horse, it's not by animal, it's on foot. And you're probably wondering why, if the world is so big, why do I have to fast travel on foot? Because they said that they made the game so dynamic that every area that you go to and you're traveling to, there's always going to be something to do. So they want you to explore as much as you possibly can. Now there is one more additional way you can actually travel in and that is by via an ox cart. The only caveat to that is that you actually have to go wherever the ox cart is actually going. You cannot drive or move the Oscar to go to your specific location. You basically have to just kind of hitch a ride and go to wherever they're going or just take it as a shortcut. So do keep that in mind. It's something very different that we're not really used to in RPGs, being able to just go anywhere we want and not have like a horse or some sort of riding mount to use. Now we can't talk about Dragon Dogma without talking about the monsters you're going to be fighting. So you're going to be fighting anything from small goblins, hobgoblins, all the way to dragons known as drakes in addition to that guys there are going to be mythical creatures and magic casting creatures along the way like the doolan and the weight and you're also going to have to fight really crazy big monsters which is like cyclops or talos and the great thing about this game and i think what makes this game stand out that we really haven't seen too many games actually perfect and i gotta be honest this game does it so well is allowing you to jump on top of the monster and becoming a badass. Literally just getting on top of the monster, slashing him, hitting him upside the head. There's this awesome fight where you're fighting a Colossus. He has one eye and you're actually able to stab his eye. Really, really crazy stuff. Now, in addition to that, you're also able to use the environment to your own benefit, like having hit a tree, breaking out a dam to make sure he throws water to damage the the, uh, the boss or the character or the enemy. So a lot of really cool stuff 
And I think this is what sets the game apart, that there are not only really small creatures in the world, they are large creatures, they are medium-sized creatures, and in addition to that, it's layered upon different mythical creatures as well, giving you a nice array of different monsters that you'll encounter as you progress throughout the game. Now, on top of this, there's even more stuff we could talk about Dragon Dogma 2, but that would make this into a whole hour video. So I'm going to be covering the next video is going to be going over what is the best class to pick as a starting class. So if you guys want to catch that video, click on it right now because it's probably appearing on the screen. And I will have that video up for you guys so you guys can know exactly what class to pick and why you should pick it depending on the play style you have in the game. If you guys want to see more Dragon Dogma coverage here on the channel, make sure you guys hit that like, subscribe, turn those notifications so you guys won't miss when our videos go live. Thank you guys for watching and I'll catch you guys on the next one.